The Prophecies and Revelations of St. Bridget of Sweden The sun speaks. Three men are said to have fallen because of women. The first was a king whose lover struck him on the face when he did not smile at her. This is because he was a fool and could not restrain her nor cared about his own honor. He was like a donkey wearing a crown a donkey because of his foolishness, a crown because of his rank. The second was Samson who, though the strongest of men, was beaten by a woman. He had the heart of a hare, since he was unable to master a single woman. The third was Solomon who was like a basilisk that kills by a glance but is killed by a mirror. Thus, the wisdom of Solomon exceeded all the rest, yet a woman's look slew him. Woman must therefore be subject to man. The son speaks to the bride. I am the creator of the universe. Two pages, as it were, lie open before me. Mercy is written on the one, justice on the other. Mercy is, accordingly, pronounced to anyone who repents of his sins and resolves to sin no more, for my spirit shall inspire him to perform good works. Whoever freely desires to be separated from the vanities of this world is made more fervent by my spirit. The person who is even ready to die for me will be so inflamed by my spirit that he will be holy in me and I in him. Justice is written on the other page. This says, The Father will not defend nor will the Son reconcile nor will the Spirit inflame anyone who does not rectify himself while there is time but who knowingly turns away from God. Therefore, while there still is time, meditate carefully on the page of mercy, for all who are saved will be cleansed either by water or by fire, that is, either by a small amount of penance in the present time or by the fire of purgatory in the future, until they are purged. Know that I showed these two pages of the Book of Mercy and Justice to a man whom you know. However, he scorns the page of my mercy and thinks that the left side is the right side. Like a heron over sparrows, he seeks to rise above everyone else. So he should fear for himself because, if he does not watch out, he will die in his scorn and be taken away from this world along with the drinkers and scoffers. So it also turned out afterward. He got up contented from the dinner table but was killed at night by his enemies. The mother speaks, I am the queen and mother of mercy. My son, the creator of the universe, feels such sweet affection toward me that he has given me a spiritual understanding of all creatures. I am thus very like a flower from which bees gather sweet nectar in the greatest abundance. No matter how much they gather from it, there still remains nectar on it. So too I am able to gain grace for everyone and yet always abound in grace. My chosen ones are indeed like bees, for they love me with all devotion and care for my honor. Like bees they have two feet, for they have a continual desire to increase my honor and also labor assiduously for it, working all they can. They have two wings as well, in that they consider themselves unworthy to praise me and also are obedient in all that refers to my honor. They even have a sting and die if they lose it. Yes, the friends of gods have the tribulations of the world that, for the safeguarding of the virtues, will not be taken away from them until the end of their lives. Yet I, who abound in consolation, shall console them. The son speaks to the bride. I told you earlier that you should have limpid eyes in order to see the evil you have done and the good you have neglected to do. Let your mouth, that is, your mind, be clean of all evil. Its lips are the two desires you should have, the desire to give everything up for my sake, and the will to remain with me. These lips should be red in color, for red is the most becoming of colors and can be seen from farthest away. Color signifies beauty, and all beauty is found in the virtues, because it is more acceptable to God when someone offers that which he or she loves the most, and that which is more spiritually edifying for others. Therefore, whether in affections or with deeds, a person should give to God that which he or she holds dearest. It can be read that God rejoiced when his work was completed. God rejoices whenever a person offers his or her whole self up to him with the intention of living according to God's will whether in suffering or in joy. Your arms should be flexible and agile with respect to God's honor. The left arm represents the contemplation of my favors and the good I have done for you by creating and redeeming you, as well as of your own ingratitude toward me. The right arm is a love so fervent for me that you would rather suffer torment than lose me or provoke me to anger. Willingly I take my rest between these two arms, and your heart shall be my heart, for I am like a fire of divine love, 
and I want to be loved fervently there in your arms. The ribs that protect your heart are your parents, not your natural parents, but my chosen ones whom you should love like me and more than you love your own parents. They are truly your parents, for they have caused you to be born again to life eternal. The skin of the soul should be so beautiful as not to have any blemish. The skin here stands for your every neighbor whom, if you love him as yourself, my love and the love of my saints is kept inviolate. However, if you hate him, then your heart gets injured and your ribs are stripped away, that is, the love of my saints will become smaller in you. Your skin should be without a blemish, for you ought not to hate your neighbor but to love everyone according to God's will, for then my whole heart will be with your heart. I was saying to you earlier that I want to be loved fervently, for I am like a fire of divine love. There are three marvelous things about my fire. First, it burns but is never enkindled. Second, it is never extinguished. Third, it burns but is never consumed. In this way, my love for humankind existed from the beginning in my divine nature. When I assumed my human nature, it burned even more. It burns so intensely that it is never extinguished but renders the soul fervent, not consuming her but strengthening her evermore. You may gather this from the example of the phoenix. In old days she gathers wood on a high mountain. Then, once the wood is set aflame from the heat of the sun, she throws herself into the fire and, having thus died, comes back to life through that very fire. So to the soul, set aflame by the fire of divine charity, emerges from it like the phoenix better and stronger than ever. The sun speaks, I am the creator of all spirits good and bad. I am also their ruler and helmsman. Moreover, I am the creator of all animals and of each thing that exists, and has life as well as of all each thing that exists but does not have life. Thus, whatever there is in heaven, on earth, or in the sea, each and every one of them is according to my will except for humankind alone. Know, therefore, that some men are like a boat that has lost both rudder and mast, and gets tossed here and there on the swell of the sea until it runs into the cliffs of the island of death. There are on this boat those who, in despair, give their minds over to sensual pleasure. Others are like a boat that still has its mast and rudder and an anchor with two cables. However, the main anchor is broken, and the rudder is on the verge of shattering whenever the force of the waves forces itself between the boat and the rudder. Care must therefore be taken because, while the rudder and boat are still connected, they have, as it were, mutual warmth among themselves thanks to that connection. The third boat has all its riggings and equipment, and is set to sail whenever the time comes. The first anchor, the main anchor that I mentioned earlier, is religious discipline that is lowered and lightened with the patience and fervor of divine love. This anchor has been shattered, inasmuch as what the fathers laid down has now been cast underfoot and everyone regards whatever he finds useful as a part of the religious profession. They are thus carried about like a boat upon the waves. The second anchor, which, as I said, is still in one piece, is the intention of serving God. This is tied by two cables, namely by faith and hope, for they believe me to be God and place their hope in my will to save them. I am their rudder, and so long as I am in the boat, the swell of the waves does not enter it and there exists a kind of warmth between them and me. I remain connected to their boat when they love nothing as much as me. I am attached to them by the three nails of godly fear, humility, and the contemplation of my works. But if they love anything more than me, then the water of disintegration enters, then the three nails of fear, humility, and divine contemplation disintegrate, the anchor of goodwill is shattered, and the cables of faith and hope are broken. The people in this boat are in a state of great insecurity, and are thus headed for dangerous places. My friends are found on the third boat because, as I said, it is set for sailing. The sun speaks. Whoever desires to be a fighter has to be noble in spirit, and get up again if he falls, trusting not in his own power but in my mercy. A person who does not trust in my goodness has the following thoughts. If I make any attempts at restraining the flesh by fasting or struggling in vigil, I will not be able either to persevere or to keep myself from vices, for God does not help me that person deserves to fall. Hence, a person who wants to be a spiritual fighter trusts in me and is confident that he will be able to achieve it with the aid of my grace. So he should have the intention of doing good and avoiding evil and of getting up again whenever he falls. He should say this prayer, 
Lord God Almighty, you who guide all souls toward the good, I am a sinner who has strayed far away from you through my own wrongdoing. I thank you for leading me back to the right path, and I ask you, gracious Jesus, who hung on the cross in blood and sorrow, to have mercy on me. I entreat you by your five wounds and by the pain that passed from your shattered veins to your heart. Deign to keep me safe today, lest I fall into sin. Give me the power to withstand the spears of the enemy and to get up again manfully, should I chance to fall into sin. In addition, in order that the fighter may be able to persevere in the good, let him pray in this way, O Lord God, for whom nothing is impossible and who can do all things, give me the strength to carry out good works and to be able to persevere in the good. After this, he should take his sword in hand, that is, he should make a good confession, which must be polished and gleaming. It must be polished by a careful examination of conscience regarding how, and how much, and where he has failed, and why. It should also be gleaming in the sense that he must not be ashamed of anything nor hide anything nor describe a sin in a way other than he has committed it. This sword should have two sharp edges, namely, the intention of no longer sinning and the intention of making up for the sins he has committed. The point of the sword should be contrition. This slays the devil whenever a man who earlier delighted in sin feels contrition and sorrow for having provoked me, his God, to anger. The sword should have the hilt of the consideration of God's great mercy. His mercy is so great that no one is such a sinner that he cannot obtain forgiveness, provided he asks for it with a will to improve. The sword of confession, then, must be held with this idea that God has mercy on all. However, in order that his hand may not be cut by the edges, a piece of iron is placed in between the edge and the hilt. A pommel prevents the sword from falling from his hand. Similarly, a person who holds the sword of confession and hopes in God's mercy for the remittance and cleansing of sin must beware not to let it fall by presuming on God's forgiveness. To prevent this there is the bolt of godly fear that makes him afraid that God will take away his grace and display anger because of his presumption. In order that his operative hand may not be cut or impaired, a piece of iron is placed between the hand and the edge. This is the consideration of God's fairness, for though my justice is so great that I leave nothing unexamined or unpunished, yet I am also so merciful and fair that I demand nothing beyond what nature can bear. Moreover, I forgive great punishment for the sake of a good intention and great sin in return for a little reparation. The knight's coat of mail represents abstinence. Just as a coat of mail consists of many small rings of chain, so too abstinence consists of many virtues, for example, abstinence from immoral sights or things affecting the other senses, from gluttony and lust and superfluity, and from many other things that St. Benedict laid down as forbidden. One cannot put this coat of mail on alone without another's help. Therefore my mother, the Virgin Mary, should be invoked and venerated, for every good example and type of virtue are to be found in her. If she is steadfastly invoked, she will indicate to your spirit all the perfect types of abstinence. The helmet stands for perfect hope. It has two openings, as it were, through which the knight can see. The first opening is the consideration of what things must be done, and the second that of what things must be avoided. Everyone who hopes in God should always consider what must be done or avoided in accordance with God's will. The shield stands for patience with the help of which one can cheerfully endure anything that happens. The sun speaks, my friends are like my arm. An arm has these five things skin, flesh, blood, bones, and marrow. I am like a wise doctor who first cuts away all the useless matter, then joins flesh to flesh and bone to bone and afterward applies healing medicine. This is how I have treated my friends. First, I removed from them all worldly passions and illicit carnal desires. Then I joined my marrow to their marrow. What is my marrow if not the power of my divinity? As a man without marrow is dead, so too that person dies who has no communion with my divinity. I have joined my divinity to their infirmity when they taste my wisdom and it bears fruit in them, when their soul understands what to do and what to avoid. The bones stand for my strength. I have joined it to their strength when I make them strong in order to do good. The blood signifies my will. I have joined it to their will when their will accords with what I will, and when they neither seek nor desire anything but me alone. Flesh signifies my long-suffering patience. 
I have joined it to their patience when they are as patient as I was when I had not a sound spot from the sole of my foot to the crown of my head. The skin signifies love. I have joined it to myself when they love nothing as much as me, and when they wish to die for my sake freely and with my help. The sun speaks to the bride, you should humble yourself in four ways, first of all, before those who wield power in the world. One should defer to authority both because it is right for men to obey other men, inasmuch as humankind scorn to obey God, and because people cannot get on without someone to direct them. Second, humble yourself before those who live in spiritual poverty, that is, before sinners, by praying for them and giving thanks to God because, fortunately, you either have been nor are one of them. Third, humble yourself before those who live in spiritual wealth, that is, before the friends of God, by regarding yourself as unworthy to serve them or to be in their company. Fourth, humble yourself before those who are poor in the world, by helping and clothing them and by washing their feet. The sun speaks, I told you earlier that my friends are my arm. This is true for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and my mother, with all the heavenly hosts, are in them. My divine nature is like the marrow without which no one can live. The bones are my human nature, which was strong in suffering. The Holy Spirit is like the blood, for he fills and gladdens the universe. My mother is like the flesh in which were found my divine and human natures and the Holy Spirit. The skin is the whole heavenly host. Just as the skin covers the flesh, so did my mother excel all the saints in virtue. Though the angels are pure, she is purer still. Though the prophets were filled with God's Spirit, though the martyrs suffered greatly, yet my spirit was fuller and more fervent in my mother, and she was greater than any martyr. The confessors certainly practiced complete abstinence, but my mother had still more perfect abstinence, for in her was found my divinity along with my humanity. Thus, when my friends have me, there is found in them my divine nature that vivifies the soul. My human nature is found in them and makes them strong unto death. The blood of my spirit is found in them and renders their will quick to perform every good action. Their flesh is filled with my own flesh and blood when they refuse to sin and keep themselves chaste with the help of my grace. My skin is joined to their skin when they imitate the life and conduct of my saints. In this way, my saints are aptly called my arm. You should become one of their members through the intention of progressing in virtue and by imitating them as far as you are able. Just as I unite them to myself through the union of my body, so too you should be united to them and to me through my same body. The Son speaks, I give you three precepts. First, to desire nothing beyond food and clothing. Second, not to long for spiritual things except according to my will. Third, not to be sad about anything but your own sins and those of others. If you do feel sorrow, consider then my strict judgment which you can fear and ponder from the case of a certain man who has already received his sentence. He entered the monastery with three intentions in mind. He did not want to have to work, and he did not want to have to worry about food. In the third place, he thought to himself as follows, If a temptation of the flesh should seize me, I shall be able to evade it by some means without intercourse. On account of all this, he was afflicted in three ways. Since he did not want to work, he was forced to work by threats and blows. In return for his second intention, he suffered nakedness and lack of food. Third, he was despised by everyone to such an extent that he was unable to experience any pleasure in his sensuality. When the time for his profession came, he thought to himself as follows, Since I cannot live in the world without working, it is better for me to live in the monastery and work for God. Because of his cooperative will, my mercy and justice came to him in order to cleanse him and bring him to my eternal glory. Once he had made his profession, he was struck down with a grave illness and suffered so much that his eyes went out due to the pain, his ears could hear nothing, and he was destitute in his every limb, all because he had not wanted to work. He suffered greater nakedness than he had in his worldly state. When he had delicious food, he could not eat it. When his natural appetites pined for it, he did not have it. He was so physically wasted before he died that he was like a cumbersome log. When he died, he came like a thief to his trial, because he had wanted to live in the religious state according to his own preferences and not for the improvement of his life. 
Yet it was not fitting for him to be sentenced like a thief, since, though he was childish and foolish in his reason and conscience, still he had faith and hope in me, his God, and therefore he was sentenced in accord with mercy. Because his sin could not be fully purged by means of his physical punishment, his soul is now being so severely punished in purgatory that it is as though his skin had been peeled off and his bones placed in an oil press so as better to squeeze the marrow out of them. How those people will suffer who have spent their entire lives in sin, and who never did, or willed anything to the contrary. Woe to them, for they say to me, Why did God die or what use was there in his death? This is how they repay me for redeeming them and saving them and giving them health and all that they need. I shall therefore seek judgment from them because they have broken the faith that they pledged to me in baptism, and because they do wrong every day and scorn my commandments. I shall not let their least little dereliction of religious duty go unpunished. Explanation This brother had a secret sin and never wished to confess it. On the command of Christ, Lady Bridget went to him and said, Do more diligent penance, for there is something hidden in your heart, and as long as you keep it shut up, you will not be able to die. He answered her that there was nothing that he had not made known in confession. But she said, Examine your intention upon entering the monastery, and with what intention you have lived up to now, and you shall find the truth in your heart. Then he broke into tears and said, Blessed be God who has sent you to me. Now that you have spoken of my secret, I am willing to tell the truth to those listening. I do have something hidden in my heart that I never dared nor could bring out. As often as I have repented in confession of my other sins, my tongue was always tied about this one. An exceedingly great shame took hold of me, and I could not confess the secret remorse of my heart. Each time I made confession of my heart, I invented for myself a new conclusion to my wording. I used to say, Father, I confess my guilt to you concerning all the sins I have mentioned and even any others that I have not mentioned. I thought that in this way all my hidden sins would be pardoned. But now, my lady, if it please God, I will gladly tell the whole world about all I have concealed in my heart for so long a time. A confessor was called, and he made a complete and tearful declaration of his sins. He died that very night. The Son of God speaks to the bride and says, Exterior beauty symbolizes the interior beauty a person ought to have. So when you are putting on your veil to tie up your hair, you should say, Lord God, I give you thanks because you supported me when I sinned. Because of my incontinent life, I am unworthy to behold you, and so I cover my hair with a veil. The Lord added, Incontinence is so abhorrent to me that even a virgin who has the intention of indulging in lustful pleasure is not a pure virgin in my sight, unless she rectifies her intention through penance. When you cover your forehead with the veil, you should say, Lord God, you have made all creatures well and created man in your image excelling all others, have mercy on me. Because I have not used the beauty of my face unto your glory, I cover my forehead with a veil. When you put on your shoes, say, Blessed are you, my God, who commands me to wear shoes so that I may be strong and not lukewarm in your service. Strengthen me, then, so that I may be able to walk in the way of your commandments. You should show humility in all the other clothes you wear and be virtuous and self-controlled in the use of your whole body. When you come to table, say, Lord God, if you would, for you are able to do so, I should ask you to allow us to subsist without food. Now, however, because you have commanded us to take food in a reasonable way, I ask you, grant me temperance at meals so that, by your grace, I may be able to eat as my nature needs and not as my bodily appetite craves. When you go to bed, say, Blessed are you, my God, who arranges the changes of time for our relaxation and for the comfort of soul and body. I ask you to give my body rest this night, and to keep me safe from the power and deception of the enemy. The sun speaks. I stand here like a king challenged to battle. The devil stands against me with his army. In truth, my intention and steadfast purpose is such that heaven and earth and all that are in them could collapse before I deviated in even the slightest way from justice. The devil's intention is such that he would rather there be as many hells as Adam's in the sun before humbling himself. Some of the enemy are already drawing close to judgment, and there is no more of a distance between us than a couple of feet. Their banner is raised, the shield is on the arm, the hand rests on the sword but the sword has not yet been drawn. 
My patience is so great that I shall not strike them unless they strike first. The enemy's banner shows three things, gluttony, greed, and lust. Their helmet is their hardness of heart, for they pay no attention to the pains of hell nor to how abhorrent sin is to me. The openings of the helmet are carnal lust and the desire to please the world. Through such they run all about and see things that should not be seen. Their shield is the perfidy with which they excuse their sins and ascribe them to the weakness of the flesh. Thus, they think they can ask pardon for their sins for nothing. Their sword is the intention of persevering in sin. It is not yet drawn, because their wickedness is as yet unfulfilled. The sword is drawn each time they desire to sin as long as they can live. They strike each time they boast of sin and wish to remain in the state of sin. When their wickedness is thus fulfilled, then a voice in my army shall cry out and say, Strike now. Then the sword of my severity shall lay them to waste, and each one shall suffer according as he is armed. Their souls shall be snatched away by demons who are like birds of prey and are not seeking any temporal advantage, but only souls whom they can endlessly mangle to pieces. The sun speaks, I told you earlier that there is no more distance between me and my enemies than a couple of feet. Indeed they are now advancing a foot closer to the judgment. One of these feet symbolizes the reward for the good works they have done for me. Accordingly, from now on their ignominy will grow, their pleasure will turn bitter, their joy will be taken away, their trouble and sorrow will increase. The second foot is their wickedness, which is as yet unfulfilled. Just as people say that a thing is so filled it will burst, so too when their soul and body are separated, they will be condemned by the judge. Their sword is their intention of sinning. It has been drawn out halfway because, when a man is on the wane and misfortunes occur, the wicked suffer more anguish but still remain eager to sin. Fame and fortune do not allow them to ponder over sin much. As it is, they wish to live longer so as to achieve their lustful pleasure, and they are already adding to their sinning with even greater license. Woe to them, for, unless they rectify themselves, their perdition is already at hand. The son speaks through the bride to a certain prelate and tells him, You are like an immobile mill wheel. When it stands fixed and does not move, then the grain does not get ground in the mill. This will signifies your will. It should be mobile not with respect to your own will and desire but to mine, and you ought to surrender yourself completely into my hands. However, this wheel is very immobile toward my will, since the water of earthly consideration is troubling your mind too much. The contemplation of my works and my passion is almost dead in your heart, for which reason you have no feeling or taste for the food of the soul. So break through the obstacle that obstructs the passage of the water. Let the water flow so that it makes the wheel turn and become mobile again so that the grain can be easily ground. The obstacle holding back the water is mental pride and ambition. These obstruct the grace of the Holy Spirit and impede all the good fruit that the soul should be producing. Receive into your mind the true humility through which the sweetness of my spirit will flow into your soul and earthly considerations will be washed away. Humility will make your will perfectly mobile with respect to my will, and then you will begin to regard your works as seeds of grain and count my works as great. What is true humility? Certainly not caring about human popularity or disfavor. Rather, it is to tread my forgotten and neglected path not seeking after superfluous possessions but contenting yourself with simpler things. If you love this path, then you will obtain a liking for the spiritual life. Then my passion and the path of my saints will seem sweet to your mind, and you will understand how much you owe to the souls whom you have undertaken to guide. Now that you have ascended to the top of the wheel on the two feet of power and distinction, you have become covetous because of your power and proud because of your distinction. So come down now by humbling yourself in your mind and by asking the humble to pray for you. I shall surely send upon you the rapid stream of my justice and exact the last farthing from you along with an account of your affections, thoughts, words, and deeds. I shall also exact an account of the souls whom I have entrusted to your care, those whom I myself redeemed with my blood. The sun speaks, I shall give my friends four arrows. By the first shall be shot the man who is blind in one eye by the second the man who is lame in one foot, by the third the man who is deaf in one ear, by the fourth the man who lies stretched out on the ground. 
The man blind in one eye symbolizes the people who see the commandments of God and the deeds of the saints but pay them no attention. They do see, however, the pleasures of the world and covet them. Such people should be shot by saying thus, You are like Lucifer who beheld the utmost beauty of God but who, because he unjustly desired what he should not have desired, descended into hell. You shall descend there, unless you come to your senses, inasmuch as you understand the precepts of God as well as the transient nature of everything in the world. The best advice for you, then, is to hold on to what is certain and let go of what is transient, so that you do not descend into hell. The man lame in one foot symbolizes those who repent and are sorry for the sins they have committed, but who strive to acquire earthly comforts and worldly rewards. Such people should be shot in this way. You strive for the comfort of a body that worms will shortly be consuming. Strive instead for the profit of your soul that will live forever. The man deaf in one ear symbolizes those who desire to hear my words and those of my saints, but also keep their other ear open for coarse and worldly speech. Tell them thus, you are like Judas who listened to God's words with one ear but they went out the other. What he heard did not do him any good. Close your ears to empty words so that you may come to hear the angel's song. The man stretched out on the ground symbolizes those who are entangled in earthly matters yet think on and wish to know the way by which they can reform themselves. Tell them thus, the time is short. It is but a moment. Yet the punishment of hell is eternal and the glory of the saints everlasting. In order, then, to attain true life, do not worry about taking up a heavy and difficult load, for God is as just as he is kind. If the arrow comes out bloody from the heart of anyone shot in this way, that is, if he feels compunction and resolves to reform his life, then I will pour into him the oil of my grace by which his whole body will regain its strength. The mother says, At the time of my son's suffering, when his betrayer Judas approached, he bent down for Judas was small of size and gave him a kiss and said, Friend, for what have you come? And some of those there seized him immediately, while others pulled him by the hair or defiled him with their spittle. Then the son spoke, saying, I am regarded as a worm, lying as though dead in the winter. Passers-by spit on it and trample it down. This day the Jews treated me like a worm, for they held me to be the lowest and most unworthy of creatures. Even so do Christians scorn me, for they regard as meaningless everything I have done and endured for them out of love. They trample me down each time they fear and venerate man more than me, their God, each time they count my judgment for naught and fix the time and measure for my mercy according to their own conceptions. They strike me in the teeth whenever, having heard of my commandments and suffering, they say, Let us do whatever delights us in the present, and we shall obtain heaven nonetheless. If God had wanted us to perish or to punish us eternally, he would not have created us or redeemed us at such a bitter cost. That is why they shall experience my justice. While not the least little good will go unrewarded, either will the least little evil remain unpunished. They treat me with scorn as though crushing me underfoot, whenever they disregard the church's sentence of excommunication. As the excommunicated are shunned by others, so too such as these will be separated from me, inasmuch as excommunication, when it is known but scorned, causes more grievous injury than a physical sword. Since then, I appear as a worm to them, I will now come to life again through my terrible judgment. My coming will be so terrible that those who see it will say to the mountains, Fall upon us cover us from the wrathful face of God. The son says to the bride, You should be like a pipe on which the piper makes lovely music. The owner of the pipe coats it with silver on the outside so that it will look more costly, but with durable gold on the inside. You should be coated with the silver of virtuous conduct and human wisdom in order to understand what you owe to God and to your neighbor, as well as what is expedient for the eternal salvation of body and soul. You should be coated on the inside with the gold of humility, so that you long to please no one but me and are not afraid of being displeasing to other people for my sake. The piper does three more things for his pipe. First he wraps it in silk so that it does not get dirty. Second, he makes a case to keep it in. Third, he makes a lock for the case so that it will not be stolen by a thief. You should be wrapped in purity so that you no longer wish to be stained by lust or desire. Instead, struggle cheerfully to remain by yourself, because dealings with evil men corrupt virtuous conduct. 
The lock represents the diligent custody of all your senses and inner faculties so that you guard against the devil's deception in all your actions. The key, however, is the Holy Spirit. He opens your heart, exactly as I please, for my glory and the benefit of men. The Mother of God speaks, My son's heart is as sweet as the sweetest honey and as clean as the purest spring, for whatever belongs to virtue and goodness flows from it as from a spring. His heart is also most pleasant. What is more pleasant to a sensible person than the contemplation of God's love in his creation and redemption, in his life of work and his teaching, in his grace and long-suffering? His love is indeed not fluid like water, but widespread and durable, for it stays with a person until the very end, so much so that if a sinner were standing at the very gates of perdition, even then he would be rescued if he cried out with a purpose of amendment. There are two ways to reach the heart of God. The first is the humility of true contrition. This leads a person to God's heart and to a spiritual dialogue. The second way is the contemplation of my son's passion. This removes the hardness of the human heart and makes a person run toward God's heart with joy. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of death. Amen.